giant battle depends upon no one industry to a greater extent than upon the making of steel. And in the American steel industry lies one of the United Nations' surest guarantees of victory. But without the scrap metal, which forms 50% of all ingot steel, the 250 million tons of steel which American mills have turned out in the last three years could never have been produced. And because of its steel-making capacity, in this fifth year of the war, the United States finds itself the most powerful industrial nation on Earth. But great as is the capacity of America's steel mills, still to come is the final test, the test of continued steel-making in the face of a dwindling supply of heavy industrial scrap. In Washington, D.C., no man is more aware of this danger than Donald Nelson, hard-working, dynamic chairman of the War Production Board. Like so many other wartime jobs, scrap collection is not very glamorous or exciting. It's part of the routine. And often it is a little hard to see just what it has to do with beating Hitler. We must have a continuing flow of scrap in order to keep steel production at the level needed to meet our war requirements. It is imperative for all of us to realize that fact and to act on it. Sometimes that may seem like an old, old story. The salvaging of iron and steel scrap has been going on for so long and so much has been said about it. Yet this too is one of those absolutely essential fields of war work. We have not yet reached the time when we can relax our efforts. Our hardest battle trials are still to come. When they come, our armies must advance behind an avalanche of steel. From the steel industry comes the chairman of the American Industry Salvage Committee, Robert W. Wolcott, president of Lucan Steel and an expert in industrial salvage. Our national inventory of scrap has shown a steady decline since January 1943 and is now approaching a dangerous level. But as long as the war lasts, the steel industry will be asked to produce at a high rate of operations with a corresponding demand for scrap. For every ton of steel produced, at least a half a ton of steel scrap is required. This scrap, in large part, must come from the home front from obsolete and worn out equipment. It is inconceivable that the war effort should suffer for the lack of a single pound of steel or even be delayed due to the lack of scrap at any steel producing center. This decline in scrap must be checked. Steel scrap must flow to the mill. This is becoming a serious situation and is a definite challenge to industry. Scheduled for production in 1944 are close to 20 million tons of merchant shipping on which the transport of war materials to our allies depends and without which food and weapons could not be supplied to our own troops overseas. In these ships will be transported the thousands of tons of shells which U.S. munitions plants are turning out. And since the requirements of global war are insatiable, the steel used in making shells is steel which will be totally expended. In this war, in which armored forces are employed on so vast a scale, tanks by the hundreds must be made. And into one U.S. medium tank goes 30 tons of steel. Steel which can be made only by using scrap. Today, near every major port in the United States are stored the stockpiles of materiel, which are a guarantee that our troops will continue to be supplied with the most efficient equipment American industry can produce. The Army must have readily available for shipment huge quantities of spot items to be delivered to our fighting men and to our allies for specific operations in combat areas on every battlefront. 
and replacements for battle losses, especially severe in mechanized warfare, must be ready to move at a moment's notice, along with supplies of fuel in steel drums and special automotive equipment from the storage depots to the ports of embarkation. And at the docks, invaluable materiel, the product of thousands of hours of work from steel ingot to finished weapon, begins its voyage to the battlefront. For over three years, American steel mills have been drawing scrap at the rate of 45 million tons a year from every available source. And despite the slow movement from time to time of production scrap to the mills, there is still a real need for continuing segregation and delivery of this scrap. Close to 80% of our scrap supply has been metal which industry itself has furnished in the form of worn out tools, machines and dormant equipment. It is this heavy scrap which is in the highest demand because it makes top quality fighting steel. Today, in order to bolster the nation's diminishing stockpiles of scrap, obsolete military equipment is being salvaged. And whenever possible, battlefield scrap is being shipped back for use in America's steel mills. In Washington's mammoth Pentagon building, the Army's concern for steel production has no more cogent spokesman than Major General Lucius D. Clay, Director of Materiel for the Army Service Forces. The Army of today is a highly mechanized, complex military machine, which must have huge stores of equipment if it is to carry out its planned objectives. We have as our purpose the providing of that Army with the best fighting equipment that American ingenuity can develop. The production of this equipment depends upon the supply of steel. In our direct procurement for the Army, we are using 16 million tons of steel each year. And in addition, components which eventually find their way into our military machines consume several million tons more each year. Today, our armies are on the offensive on every front. This offensive action will necessitate the constant flow of replacements to the battlefield. The supply of steel to our factories is a part of the supply line to the battlefront. We ourselves are making every effort to collect scrap from the battlefront to return it to the United States to be used again. However, our contribution to the collection of scrap can in no way meet the demand we must depend on our home front to exert its best effort to collect the huge tonnage of scrap. The steel industry must have this scrap if our armed services are to obtain the high quality of steel needed for invasion. The collection of steel scrap is a vital part of our war supply program. Allocated to the Navy are the millions of tons of steel needed to build and to equip the Seven Ocean Fleet. Hundreds of huge 16-inch naval guns must be made, each gun using tons of the highest quality steel. Deadly torpedoes are built by the thousand for our surface ships, naval aircraft, and submarines. In the plants of hundreds of contractors at work on Navy orders, all production is contingent upon a continual supply of steel. For the building of one such battleship as the Wisconsin, more than 100,000 tons of finished steel must be processed. And to make this steel, 50,000 tons of heavy scrap is used. Expert in the Navy's requirements for steel is Rear Admiral Edward L. Cochran, Chief of the Bureau of Ships. The Seven Ocean Navy and the tremendous landing craft program which we are carrying on today are taking quantities of steel beyond belief. Steel for the hulls, steel for the machinery, steel for the guns and for the ammunition. During 1944 alone, we expect to complete new men of war totaling in displacement over three and a half million tons. This means that roughly seven million tons of steel will have to be run through the mills to meet the Navy's shipbuilding program alone. The steel needed to repair battle damage, which is inevitable in this kind of a war, will be an additional requirement. 
A single salvo of the main battery guns of such a ship as the South Dakota, for example, will take 10 tons of finished steel. Our job in the Navy, until the war is over, is using steel to build and to fight. We must continue to rely on the home front efforts to collect the big tonnage of heavy industrial scrap which is needed to make the fine quality steel in the huge quantities which we need in the Navy. Huge quantities of steel and scrap for the Navy are but a part of our requirements for the rapidly mounting scale of our attacks and invasions all over the world. Plans for the invasion against Fortress Europe to be the greatest military operation in all history have been made. Since June of 1940, as the Allied nations geared their productive power to total war, the Nazi military have been feverishly working to fortify the invasion coast against the assault they knew was sure to come. And working with ruthless efficiency, they are using slave labor and looted steel and cement to erect enormous systems of defense in depth, the most formidable in the world. Tank barriers and roadblocks are built in addition to the gun emplacements and fortified positions extending from the beaches many miles inland. Daily, these Nazi fortress troops perfect their defense operations within their powerful fortifications. For more than three years, the Nazis have been building up their defense in depth. Everything useful in the great Maginot and Siegfried lines has been moved westward to fortify the invasion coasts, to crack and destroy these fortifications and to silence their great guns. Our fighting men must blast them with an avalanche of exploding steel and scrap from guns even more powerful than these giant weapons. Closely guarded has been the secret of where the invasion of Fortress Europe will take place. But in the invasion of Italy is the pattern of things to come. Against this supposedly soft underbelly, the United Nations have poured tens of thousands of fighting men and the mountain piles of equipment and materiel they have required. Every problem of supply and each obstacle in attack and defense will be magnified many times over in the final invasion of Fortress Europe. For of all military operations, the battle for the beachhead is the most difficult and costly. Prodigious supplies of weapons and equipment and materiel must be assured. Hundreds of troop and transport vessels must be convoyed to the assault areas, and the landing of troops and supplies must be coordinated with exact timing.
the lavish use of firepower gives our fighting men the best possible chance for survival in battle. But as our forces move inland, our commitments grow and the supply lines lengthen. To protect these lines and to disrupt those of the enemy, bombers daily blast at his communications and supply centers. Prime necessity for victory is superiority in our firepower. To ration firepower may mean a terrible cost in dead and wounded soldiers. Our battle casualties are directly proportional to the quantity of our weapons and our ability to stop the enemy with heavy barrages of steel and scrap and explosives. The more steel we can throw at the enemy, the less will be our casualties. But casualties occur to supply lines too. In battle zones, even the best mechanized equipment wears out or is lost in service over bombed and blasted roads. In just one week of heavy fighting, half of the mechanized and combat vehicles brought into action may be destroyed or put out of service. Battlefield wreckage representing tens of thousands of man hours of labor and millions of tons of steel and scrap must be quickly replaced. Terrible is the cost of winning a beachhead against the desperate resistance of the Germans on the coast of Fortress Europe. The attack made on Dieppe has provided impressive testimony as to the size of the job ahead when the United Nations invade the now enormously strengthened Fortress Europe. The toll of destroyed and damaged equipment is mounting daily as the intensity of the fighting increases. Replacements must be poured into the battle areas in a never-ending flood. And to maintain that flood of supplies, great quantities of heavy industrial scrap will be urgently needed as long as the war goes on. As the free nations of the world bring their forces to bear against the Axis powers, as our American fighting men start the last leg of their voyages to distant battlefronts, they must be supplied with all the weapons, all the steel for the winning punch. And to supply that steel, you in American industry must furnish the heavy scrap that makes half of every gun, tank, ship. Comb your plants for idle machinery and dormant equipment. Start every ton of that heavy melting scrap on its way to the steel furnaces. It is needed now, at once. American industry has made enormous contributions to salvage and to victory, but victory is not yet won. You men behind the winning punch must make further sacrifice and effort, for steel is the armed forces' might, the might that must bring ultimate victory.